on my way to hell, if not already there. But it is of the Lord's mercies that I'm not consumed, for they are renewed every day. Great is thy faithfulness. You know, part of that song talks about a church service. You've heard it. And it talks about uh, the preacher made his final plea. One day I'll preach my last sermon. I don't know when that'll be. But one day I'll preach my last one. Robbie, one day it'll be your last one. Jimmy, one day it'll be your last one. I don't know when that's coming. But there's going to come a day when it's your last sermon too. The last message you get to hear. The last gospel we'll ever get to know. The last time and then the Lord's going to call our number. When that number is called, I don't know. But I'll tell you this, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to meet him. If the Lord calls, I'll go home with joy in my heart and a smile on my face because I know I'm going to see Jesus. Do you have that assurance? I hope you do. If you don't, you can before we leave here today. I hope you'll not leave without it. And uh, I believe that the Lord's coming is as soon near as it's probably ever been. I don't know if you've been watching the news lately, but uh, we are just daring God to do something. And I'm going to preach this morning out of the book of Amos. And this is going to be uh, a little tough for some of you, but that's all right. The Lord will help you. Amos chapter 1. The Old Testament prophet, the little shepherd boy that God used to bring a message to his people who had turned knucklehead, just about like America has. Can any of us say that God has not blessed America? Can any of us say that God has not had his hand on America for a good long time? He's kept us out of trouble. He has blessed us. He has prospered us. He has made it to where America stands at the top of history as one of the most prosperous nations that the world has ever seen. But I believe in my humble yet accurate opinion that we are shaking our fist in the face of God and uh, one of these days God's going to do something about it. I want to preach to you this morning on enough is enough. Enough is enough. Amos starts out his book or God starts out speaking to Amos giving him a message to deliver. And I'll tell you, it's not a great message. It's a stern message. It's a hard message. But I'll tell you, some of the things Amos says are some of the same things that the United States of America needs to hear right now. God has blessed and prospered this nation, but there's going to come a day when God's going to say, enough is enough. So in a way of foundation, let's look at verses 1 and 2. We're going to cover more than that, but just in a way of foundation. Amos chapter 1, verses 1, verse number 2. If you've got it, say amen. The Bible says the words of Amos, who was among the herdmen at Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Josiah, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord will roar from Zion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the inhabitants of shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. Father, we stand in your presence this morning. Oh, so thankful. Lord, my heart's so stirred and joyed that I'm redeemed and that I'm your child and that you are there. Father, it's just been such a wonderful reminder since the beginning of the morning with Sunday school of how much that you love us. Now, God, we stand in a very uh, odd time in history. We stand in the middle of a time when it seems that too many, so many, are turning away from you and we're almost just trying to provoke you. And Father, we know it's of your mercy that you allow us to have another day. It's of your grace that you blessed us with this opportunity. And God, as a song sung, this could be our last chance to be together. So let us hear what your word has to say. May we hear your spirit as he speaks to our heart. Bless the reading of your word. Hide me behind Jesus that he may be heard and seen and felt. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing with me. Amos was called of God a little shepherd boy to be a prophet. And one thing you'll notice if you read and study throughout the Bible is that when God's got a message he needs delivered, he doesn't always go to the uh, university. He doesn't always go to the educated ones. He doesn't always go to the ones that's got influence and affluence and prosperity and money and pull and power. That's not where he typically goes. He goes to the ones that society might look at as, who's this guy? When Jesus was born, who'd he talk to? He talked to the shepherds. So here, he's got a message and he's delivered. And what's his message? I've just about had all I can take. I've just about had it, and yuns are fixed to find out about it. 
Now, folks, let me tell you something. I'm not a prophet of doom and gloom this morning. I'm no prophet at all, but I'm telling you, God's about to that point again. Uh, we are alive by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ allows this country to prosper and to blossom. But, my friend, there's coming a day when God's going to say, enough is enough. This stops now. And let me tell you something. My kids know when I get mad. It scares them. <laughs> I get mad once every 12 years. Jimmy, go like this. I ain't look, don't look at Brandy, Jimmy. <laughs> when I get mad, they know it. And that look in their eyes, uh-oh, <laughs> we made Daddy mad. Let me tell you something, we made God mad. And the only thing right now keeping this country from plunging under the judging hand of God is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ as he stands as intercessory between us and God and says, God, Father, hang on. I died for them. I paid the price for them. There's still yet some to come to the kingdom. Lord, there's, and I don't know how that conversation goes exactly, but I'll tell you this, the only thing keeping God from saying enough is enough and starting a similar thing to what we're getting ready to read about is Jesus. Never forget, Jesus is all that stands between us and the wrath of God. Never forget, Jesus is the only one that can keep us from the wrath of God. Now, Amos was told, Amos, you got a message to deliver. I kept looking for Andy, but I didn't find him, so it was just Amos as far as I know. But Amos got told, it's time to talk. Now, if you'll look, I want to show you this. There are eight cities that he talks to. You see, in Israel, these northern kingdoms were very prosperous. They were, I mean, they were doing as good as they've ever been under these kings mentioned before. They were doing so good. They had everything they wanted. The economy was great. Money was great. Man, they had everything. They had no, no want for anything. But you see, what came with that is when they had everything they ever wanted, they forgot that God was all they really needed. And morality went through the toilet. It went through the floor. It sank to a place to where these cities became vile and wicked. Now, Amos was from the southern kingdom, so this southern boy got called to go up and talk to these Yankee boys and say, hey, you just done made God mad. Now you're in trouble. So this morning, this southern boy is going to tell some of y'all, we done made God mad. And them Yankees up there in New York better listen, amen, because they're going to elicit the wrath of God on this country. And if 9-11 didn't teach us something, we need to get our eyes opened up. God ain't going to let foolishness go on very long. One day he's going to say, enough is enough. Now I want you to see, look what he says to Damascus in verse 3. For thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment. He said, I've had enough. I've watched you once. I've watched you twice. I've watched you three times. And I've had enough. I've seen that fourth time, Damascus. That fourth time I've told you to quit doing this stuff. I've given you chance and chance and chance. Now I've had it. He said, I will not turn away the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with the threshing instruments of iron. Go to verse 6. He says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. He tells Gaza, I've had enough. Look on verse 9. He tells Tyre, for thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. He says, Tyre, I've had enough out of you. Verse 11, thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Edom and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof. He tells Edom I'm sick and tired of it. I've had enough. Verse 13, thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of the children of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. He says, Ammon, I've had enough. Chapter 2, verse 1, For thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Moab. And for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he buried the bones of the king of Edom, or burned them, rather, into lime. Uh, uh, and uh, he says to, verse 4, to Judah of chapter 2, Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Judah. And for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments, and their lies cause them to err. After the which their fathers have walked. And then he gets to Israel, verse number 6. He says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. He said, I've had enough. He said, I've been watching you. I've been protecting you. I've been blessing you. And you messed up time after time after time. And God said, I have had enough. Enough is enough. I will not turn away my punishment, or judgment, rather. Now, that ought to scare us. That ought to get us to paying some attention. We have so become accustomed to living under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we just don't care anymore. Who cares what New York does, preacher? What they do in New York don't bother me. Bless God, it will, too. 
uh, they're part of this country and God ain't afraid to judge a whole nation over somebody's stupidity and let me tell you he's done it before he'll do it again how dare we shake our fist in the face of God and say God I dare you to do something Oh, boy, that's what we're doing. One day God's going to say enough is enough. And Jesus Christ and his mercy and his grace is going to step aside and the Father is going to come. Revelation tells us, they didn't have studied in Revelation in the Sunday school. Keep reading on, brother. You'll find out one day he's coming. And when he's coming, guess what he's bringing with him? Oh, he's bringing heaven, the new Jerusalem. Yeah, buddy, that's at the end of the book. That's at the end of it. Don't forget what he's bringing from chapter 4 to chapter 19. He's bringing wrath. He's bringing judgment. He has said, I've had enough. Now you're going to pay for it. Listen to me, friends. If there's a time we need to be praying, it's right now. America is shaking its fist at God, daring him to do something. And I'm as scared he's going to. We need to pray, God have mercy. God have mercy on them poor, foolish, heathen people who will get up there and sign a bill condoning the murder. Let me say it's murder. You with me? Hoyt, amen, it's murder. Murder of babies up until the second before they're born. Tell me that's not out of hell. Tell me that's not heathenistic and satanic. Tell me that's not of the, of the devil. And oh, they sit there smiling, clapping, giggling, laughing. Look what great things we've done. My friend, they have looked God in his eyes and said, what you going to do about it? And they better pray the Lord Jesus Christ steps in. Because if he don't, my friend, there are bad days are coming. God one day is going to say enough, is a blasted enough of this foolishness. California, it's one that place ain't shook off the map. And if you're from there, California, I'm glad you're here now. You're better off, Amen. Let me tell you something. This, it ain't just California. It ain't just New York. Right here in Delano, Tennessee. Right down there in Benton, Tennessee. Up there in Etowah, in Cleveland, where I live. This heathenistic ideology is this. This out of hell, shake your fist at God, what you going to do about it mentality exists everywhere. Right. Amos said, boys, y'all have messed up now. God is mad. For three transgressions, he let it go. But then the fourth one, he's not. Where are we at, preacher? I got no idea. I'll tell you where we are. We're on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are touching and holding and squeezing for all the life and sin us the hem of his garment, praying, Lord Jesus, keep us from the wrath of God. But I'm telling you what, folks, I'm scared to death, and God's eating me up with this message. I'm scared to death that something is coming. God about put New Orleans and Louisiana off the map with Katrina. You ever been to New Orleans? Voodoo capital. All kind of mysticism. Oh, it's fun times down there, preacher. Oh, yeah, sure, it's fun. The Bible says there's lots of fun in sin. Let me tell you something. God didn't like that. Are you telling me that's why God sent that? I don't know why God does what he did. I don't know why that thing hit, but I'll tell you what I see, and I'll tell you what I can deduct from that, and I'll tell you we better quit messing with God. We better quit, if you will, poking the bear because that bear is going to bite back. Amos said, hey, boys. <laughs> We've done it now. We're in trouble. Now, let me show you what they've done. Let me give you four thoughts, okay? And uh, I, I want you to see that this is what's going on right now, and we need to get a hold of this. And Christians, listen to me. We need to be praying, okay? Uh, well, just preach God's going to do what God's going to do. We just need to, you know, pray that, uh, you know, God will just do what you better. You better wake up. This is your family. These are your kids. If the Lord tarries another generation, your kids are going to grow up and have families of their own. Your grandkids are going to come up, have families of their own. Do you want to hand to God on this country, or do you want it under judgment? You tell me that. You better start praying. You better start praying God gets a hold of these knuckleheads and wakes them up and shows them what they're doing before they just... It, 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 it almost is to me like they're standing there opening the door and saying, God, I, if you're going to do something, come on, do it. We dare you. And I only hope this country got is for God's people to be praying. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let me show you. Go back to verse 3. Let me show you this. First of all, they were mistreating each other. Let's talk about the brotherly covenant. They were mistreating each other. Look at verse 3. For thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have threshed Gilead with the threshing instruments of iron. Now jump down to verse 6 where he talks to Gaza. He says because they have carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. Jump down to verse 9 to Tyre. He says because they delivered up the whole captivity of Edom and remembered not 
the brotherly covenant. They were being mean and hateful and spiteful and mistreating to each other. Brotherly love no longer existed. This brotherly covenant had been thrown out. What are we living in today? Bless God, we're living in a country where if you wear the wrong hat, you're a racist. We're living in a country where if you wear a t-shirt that says something somebody don't like, you're a bigoted fool. What is going on in this country? What's going on in this world? Brotherly love is gone. We hate our brothers. We'll hate them before we'll love them. And it ain't just the lost man. The church has bought into this mess. We've all bought into it. God says, you know, you pass from death unto life if you love your neighbor. And we don't love them no more. We could care less what happens to them. God said, I'm going to judge them for it. They want to hate each other. They want to treat each other like garbage. They want to let that brotherly covenant, verse 9, go away. I'm going to fix this. You know what we did to our kids one time? Brandy did this, and I thought it was very cute. The boys and Lily fuss and fight, fuss, fuss and fight, fuss and fight. She made a, or was it just the boys? She made them a cardboard sign. Yeah, they said, we're brothers and we love each other. Made them stand out in the front yard hugging, holding that sign. <laughs> Didn't you, boys? But let me tell you something. God won't be that nice. You know why we don't love each other? Because we don't love Him. Can I get in your, can I get in your corner a minute? We don't love each other because we don't love Him. If we don't love Him, we cannot love each other because love is of God. And if we don't love Him, well, matter of fact, you can tell how some people love God by how they treat each other. Boy, this is bad. Jimmy, you might be have to preaching for a while. I might be gone. They might, they might collect my keys after this is done. Amen. The brotherly covenant. God judged three of these eight. Okay? Three. Because they didn't love each other. Because they were treating each other like garbage. Because they were delivering each other up to be beat and abused and hurt. They didn't care what happened to each other. They just wanted to fight. I just don't like you. I don't care what you've done. I don't like Jimmy's mustache. Yeah. Sorry, devil. He's got to be something wrong. Anybody wear a mustache like that's got to be. I mean, <laughs> stuff like that. But I'll tell you what, folks, we can laugh. And, and, that, and that was meant to be funny. What I said about the kids, you, you can laugh at things like that. But I'm telling you, us not loving each other is a serious thing. And God looks at his church, and he expects us to show the love of Christ to every breathing soul on this planet. And when we stop doing that, okay, how in the world do we expect the heathen to do it? Brotherly love is not for the heathen. It's for the Christian. Amen. We can't expect Christians to love like Christ. They don't even know him. God judged his people Amen. because they weren't loving. Amen. Christians, listen, we better fall in love with the lost man. Amen. We better fall in love with the uncomely ones. We better fall in love with them heathens out there that we can't stand. You best quit bad-mouthing them start praying for them. You better start loving them because God's angry. And by the way, if I remember correctly, he talks to these three for this issue, and that's the most cities. There's two, two, and two. These three had this issue of not loving. Now, uh, they're mistreating each other. They broke the brotherly covenant. Secondly, they were murdering each other. I want you to see the bloody cruelty of it. Look at verse 11. And the Lord said, For three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Notice this. Because he did pursue his brother with a sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. Look again in uh, verse 13. What he says to Ammon. He says, They have ripped up the women with child of Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. Does anybody else hear the alarms going off? Does anybody else hear God's voice saying, Yuns are about to get it. <laughs> I've just about had it with you. You ever told your kids, I've had it. <laughs> I'm whooping your tail. It's time for punishment. Folks, listen to me. I pray the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, praise mercy and grace over us because if not, oh man. God Amen. said they were murdering each other they were pursuing each other in verse 11 with a sword they cast off all their pity 
we don't care what we don't care the anger did tear perpetually they kept wrath forever all we want to do is fight all we want to do is fight we're not worried about bringing up our brothers and sisters we're worried about tearing them down and America has more embraced abortion what are we doing now we ought to pray there's a few states and I heard Tennessee's one uh, I don't know that to be true but there are some states that are trying to pass laws now that say if the heartbeat is detected it cannot be touched it cannot be aborted uh, that's, that's probably as close as we'll ever get to having it off the books completely most of you mothers know by the time you realize there's a heartbeat you had no idea you just found out that you were pregnant and then they find a heartbeat immediately I think the heart starts to beat of a baby say eight days or something like that after conception nobody knows they're pregnant for usually a few weeks that's the only really hope we've got and we better be praying that these states that want to do that pass this stuff because somebody's going to have to get in the gap between God and New York amen somebody's going to have to get in the gap between God and California somebody's going to have to get in the gap between this heathenistic ideology that says life is not life and life does not matter somebody's going to have to stand in the gap because they're murdering each other that's what we're doing do we not remember when God judged that cut they had Molech you remember Molech I told you about Molech this iron God that had arms out like this and he was a big statuesque God and his belly was hollowed out to have a fire built in the belly and what they would do is they would burn this fire in the belly of Molech and they would take their infant children and throw them into the arms of Molech and this metal frame with this fire turned it into a, a, a frying pan for all intents and purposes hollow metal with fire gets excruciatingly hot they would throw their children into the arms of Molech and sacrifice them to the gods now we ain't doing nothing like that yes we are yes it's the same thing and you disagree with me you can be wrong if you want to it's the same thing it is no different well in the womb it's not a person tell God that tell God that he told Jeremiah before I formed you I done ordained you who was the first person to rejoice at the announcement of the birth of Christ where was John the Baptist oh say life begins when that baby is formed and you'll never convince me otherwise they were murdering each other with swords they had lost all pity they had lost anything within them that had compassion on their fellow man they were a murderous bunch of uh, hulums the brotherly covenant had been broken the bloody cruelty was running rampant not just that we could preach on that all day but go to chapter 2 and verse 1 I want you to see not only the brotherly covenant not only the bloody cruelty but I want you to see they were balking command chapter 2 verse 1 says thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Moab and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime jump to verse 4 he says thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Judah and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments and their lies cause them to err after the which their fathers have walked they rebelled against authority they said we are not going to be governed by anybody they took Edom and killed him burned him they won't be ruled by him they look at the law of God and say we ain't going by that that's crazy that's archaic that's for the people that lived a long time ago we ain't worried about that law no more you remember that movement that started a decade or so ago to remove the Ten Commandments from the courthouses? Prayer from schools. It's not allowed to have Bible in most schools, but they're encouraged in prisons. Have you ever thought about that? Sounds like we need to change that. <laughs> if they were allowed in school, maybe there wouldn't be so many in prison. Amen. Okay? What is that? It's a rebellion against authority those ten commandments understand this cannot be kept by any of us in their entirety all ten of them or the other 600 that are listed they cannot be kept and you know what it is we look at them and we see the fault we see our failure we see the weakness in our flesh that's supposed to point us to Jesus that's what the law is as a schoolmaster a teacher to bring us to Christ those commandments show us we can't do it we need Jesus oh but man looks at it and says heck with that Ten Commandments. Fooey on that. We don't want that. You know what? I've told you this before too, but Darwin's theory of evolution 
came about because, and this is what they said in an interview, we could not accept the Bible's explanation for how we got here because it interferes with the way we want to live. So therefore, evolution is the next best option. You know what they said? And this is Darwin and his cronies. That's what they said. You know what they said? We ain't going to abide by God's law. We don't like God's law. We don't like what God has to say. I don't like these teachings about Jesus. So fully on that, we're going to believe we come from monkeys. We're going to believe lightning struck a swamp. Tadpoles formed. Tadpoles got out, grew legs, turned into dinosaurs, turned into birds, turned into animals, turned into the ape man. And all of a sudden, here we are. If you believe that, you need help. Amen. You're telling me you can't believe the Bible, but you'll believe that. It takes more faith to believe that hogwash than it does to believe the Word of God. Science, and we had Dr. Uh, 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 I forgot Butcher's name. He was here, and he showed us just a little bit of that stuff, way over most of our heads. But he shows us that science and history prove the Bible to be right. It's a rebellion against authority. And God said, I've had enough. God wanted to be our king, didn't he? Remember in the Old Testament? God said, I'll be your king. What'd they say? No. We want a man. God said, all right. You'll get it. He raised up Saul. Yeah. Head and shoulders above. Big, strong, strapping man. Touched his heart. Did everything he could do for Saul. How'd Saul turn out? Wicked. Every since, ever since then, we have rejected the authority of God and we look to man to govern us. Yep. And now, we won't even respect that. What does 90% of our nation think about police officers? Hate them. They're racist. They're wife beaters. They're abusers. They're criminals. Now, let me, don't get me wrong. There's, there's, there's bad eggs in every bunch, okay? There's bad eggs in here, amen? I'm one. But you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But you know what this country's taught? And our kids are coming up like this. Do not respect authority. If they will not respect the police, they're not going to respect nothing. And we wonder why our kids are like that. They, you know, I, I used to sit in the courtroom when I worked at Camelot, and I'd watch these kids, one after the other after the other, come in and smart off to the judge. And I'd be like, what in the, what, what's wrong in your skull? I mean, here, I'm dressed up nervous, and I'm sitting to the side. I'm his friend. And they walk up like they ain't got no respect for God nor man, and bad mouth the judge. And you wonder, why in the world make a kid do something like that? And then mom and daddy bad mouth the judge. And then mom and daddy speak up and get their ear in stowed in jail for 10 days, and then bad mouth the judge even more. Listen to me. There's no respect for authority. And we better understand something. God is authority. And you are going to submit to him. Now, you'll either do it willingly or he'll make you. Okay? Bible says every knee shall bow. Not might. Shall. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. You're going to. Best thing for you to do is do it on your own. Best thing for you to do is say, Lord Jesus, I submit to your word. I look at your law and I see what you expect me to do. I look at Jesus and see I've got mercy that when I make mistakes, but Lord, help me to do the best I can to live under your thumb. Oh, I don't want to live under nobody's thumb. You better get under God's thumb. God's thumb painted the universe. God's thumb spun this earth. God's thumb wrote the tablets on Sinai. God's thumb wrote in the sand whatever they're trying to stone that woman. You need that. That hand, that thumb, if you will, covered Moses in the cleft of a rock while he passed by. You need it. Yes, Submit to his authority. They wouldn't do it. God said, I've had enough. If you won't listen to me, I will get my point across, okay? Y'all loving this? This is good preaching. A good amen preaching, boy. Shout it out. Brotherly covenant, bloody cruelty, balking command. Then lastly in chapter 2, verse 6, I want you to see a blatant covetedness. Verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver, and the poor for a pair of shoes. Selfishness and greed. Selfishness and greed. Blatant covetedness. 
It's all about the almighty dollar. Our churches are guilty right here, more than probably the world. It's all about filthy lucre. The love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, the love of the money. And the sin that I see that us churches are going to have to watch out for that so many have succumbed to is money. We want big buildings, preacher. We want fancy things. We want padding on the backs of the pews, not just the bottoms. We don't want pews at all. We want chairs. We want lights. We want this. We want that. We want that. We want a gym. We want this. We want that. Listen to me. You better to give you. You better take what God gives. Go where God leads. Because I know of churches. I can start naming them, but I ain't going to do it. I can start naming them. Who went down that road. And then the church became in love with money. I could tell you of a church right now. Some of you are going to know this church, and please don't say much about it. But there's a church right now. Well, they're not anymore. They have ceased to be. But they had a beautiful little church. And they decided they wanted a big building. They threw out all the doctrine they knew, everything they was, you know, everything that was good about the church, in my opinion, throwed it all out and just welcomed any old everything that you wanted to do. Come on, do it. You want to run, slap people? Come on, run, slap people. You want to blabber off in some kind of foreign tongue that the Bible don't talk about? Come on, do it. Anything goes. And they came. But all of a sudden, this million-dollar bill and the bill had to come due, didn't it? How do you pay a million-dollar bill? Big offerings. They figured out they had to have so much money a week in offering just to pay the mortgage. You know what that pastor did? And I'm telling the truth. He made the people of that church sign commitments to give a tithe or whatever. And they made them sign an agreement, if you leave this church and go to another, you will still, st still send your tithes here for so many years. Okay? Is that right or wrong? Wrong. Do you know what it is? Selfishness and greed. Sell the righteous. That's what it is. It's all about that. My friends, the church is guilty. And we better get this straightened out before God. If God wants me to have something, I believe God will supply it for me. If God wants this church to go in a direction, I told God I'm stupid. He knows it. <laughs> it ain't just y'all realize it. God knows it too. I've told God how impotent I'm just a dummy. Lord, if we're going to do it, you're going to have to slap me right in the face with it. Lord, I don't know how to get in out the rain. If you want this church to be something, do something, go, whatever. Lord, you best put it right here and poke me in the nose with it. Or I'll not know it. And I've learned over my few years that what God wants me to do, he'll make it plain. And he'll make a way. You see, selfishness and greed is going to destroy us. God said, I've had enough of it. Them that see their brother in need, hold back. The bowels of compassion. How dwelleth the love of God in him? You know how many churches won't help nobody at all? <laughs> you know, we'd, for a while, we'd fill up at Christmas time. We'd fill the church up with stuff, toys and clothes and stuff. And we'd invite people to come in free. Take what you need. And I'll never forget down at the little white church. A lot of y'all never went there. That was a long time ago. But the little white church down in Benton. A lady come up to me. She was married, had four kids, I think it was, biracial. She had married a Hispanic man, good man, as far as I could tell, biracial children. She had went to three churches and said, I, I, I need help with my Christmas. We don't make enough to really give the kids. I'm not asking for much. Just do, do you have anything where they can help? Four churches told her no. Now, didn't offer anything either. I mean, didn't say, well, do this or go over here or try that. They saw the circumstance, so we don't want to be associated with that. It wasn't you, Robbie. <laughs> I, I, you know better than that, Robbie. It wasn't you. It wasn't you either. They shut up the bowels of compassion. How dwelleth the love of God in that? Now, we did what we could do. What we had, we told them, Here. And you know what God did? He sent a couple later that day to come in and said, we just were, we've, our kids is up and grown. We don't have no grandkids yet. God's blessed us. We want to help a family. You got anybody need something? I said, matter of fact. <laughs> they sent me pictures. I ain't never seen nothing like that. They spoiled them kids plum rotten. What is that? That's God. Amen. We weren't the ones that spoiled them. 
God spoiled them. We just let the church be an outlet for God to be able to work. We must keep the selfishness, the greed, all that stuff out. God lays out just as plain as be what he's sick and tired of. And as a country, as a community, as a church, we need to take heed of this. Now let me give you this. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Many of you know this. There's hope. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, okay, shall humble themselves. You can't do half this stuff if you're humble you need to be humble humble themselves okay and pray and seek my face okay he says then will I hear from heaven forgive their sins and heal their land the land does not need healing unless something's happened to it. God happened to it. Amos said, God's mad. And there's a price that's going to have to be paid, and it's a mighty big price. I don't know what's going to happen with this old world, but I know it's in bad shape. America used to be a beacon of hope for socialist countries. Now they want to make it a socialist country. America used to be a beacon of hope for those trying to escape the dictatorships in Russia and Germany and some of these other nations in Cuba. It used to, the, the Lady Liberty in the harbor up there used to stand and say, hey, come here. We'll love you. We'll give you a chance. Okay? Now people look at it and say, we're better off here than we are there. My friend, listen, we better pray. We better pray. We better humble ourselves. Okay? Pray and seek God's face. Because that's the things he says to do. Then, he said, I'll hear your prayer, I'll forgive your sins, and I'll hear your land. Enough is enough. I'm sick of this stuff. Ain't you? Are you sick of hearing God's name drug through the mud? Are you not sick and tired of seeing God's perfect law and his perfect word called lies? People treating each other the way they do? But can I tell you something? This abortion thing, it don't stop there. Okay, I told them at work Friday. I told them. We have a meeting every morning with leadership team, and I give devotion and prayer every day. And they pay me to do that. Ain't that good? I told them Friday morning. I said, y'all need to understand something. It won't stop with the babies. The day is coming. You got the wrong diagnosis. You'll not get medicine. If you're over a certain age... You will not be allowed to get certain treatments or surgeries. It will be reserved for the young. It will be reserved for the healthy, the ones that can recover. Mark me down as I'm standing here. It will happen. If the Lord don't tarry, he is coming. And it could happen to me. I don't know. The only hope we've got, folks, is Jesus. <laughs> the only hope we've got is to call out to Jesus. We need to be like Peter more today than we've ever been. Lord, save us. Lord, we are seeking in our own misery we're seeking in our own morality we're seeking in our own depravity Lord Jesus get us out of this yes, he's the only hope we've got has Jesus pulled you out of your sin has Jesus reached way down for you and redeemed you has he saved you if he was to come right now and it's a real chance he could would you go to meet him forgiven child of God if not you need to do something about that. And let me say, by not doing it, you're doing it. No decision is a decision. Because no decision still means you're lost. And that's a choice. If you're saved, thank God for it. But if you're, if you're lost, you, you better d decide. Because nobody's promised tomorrow. And you may think I'm trying to scare you. And you're absolutely right. <laughs> it better scare you. It's a serious thing. To fall into the hands of an angry God and I will not do that with every breath that was in me I don't want you to either so if there's one of you that's not redeemed as the song sung come to Jesus come to Jesus church we need to pray prayer meeting on Wednesday first Wednesday of the month's good but we need to have more of that personal praying time we got to pray because I believe I could almost hear God's voice one more time saying enough is enough.
Let's stand together all around the church today. As we stand, if we're able to stand, let's stand heads.